Welcome to the Open Space and Ecology meeting on October 25th, 2023. Waiting on the screen share. There you go. Uh, so I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, let's do a roll call. Uh, Shauna Colmes. Present. Michelle Simon. Present. I'm Aaron Becker. I'm present. Robert Ebel? Present. Jason Noonan? Present. Mary Rogers? Present. And we are not seeing Glenn Feldman yet, but hopefully soon. Uh, we have quorum, so let's move to uh, any requests of a committee member to attend remotely. Are there none? There are none. Perfect. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Move to adopt the agenda. Second it. Shauna? Yep. Okay. Michelle? Aye. Barbara? Aye. Jason? Aye. Mary? Aye. And I wasn't here, so I'm going to abstain. Agenda is adopted. Any? No, that's the agenda. You would abstain from the minutes. Oh, I would have abstained from the minutes. I move to adopt the agenda as well. So <laughs> I agree. So. <laughs> Any announcements? Any oral communications? I have not received any today. Perfect. Now it's time to approve the minutes. I would move we approve the minutes. I'll uh, second. All right, Shauna? Yep. Michelle? Aye. I'm going to abstain. Barbara? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I have to abstain, I wasn't here. Perfect. Um, still majority, so I think we're good. I think we're good. Can somebody tell me who was second? Barbara. Okay, thank you. And I think that brings us to new business. Indeed it does. Okay, um, so I just wanted to kind of briefly go over how we're going to go through this. Um, we have our... Um, dark skies or draft ordinance um, up for consideration. Um, on Zoom, we have John Barentine of Dark Sky Consulting, who will um, start off with, um, well, I'm going to do a, a brief introduction, um, and then John will do a, a presentation on some kind of dark sky um, concepts and why it's important, and then uh, Aaron is going to lead us through the uh, draft ordinance, uh, and then we will move into public comment if we have any on this item uh, and discussion. Um, I recognize that there are likely to be lots of questions and comments and discussion. Uh, my request is to try to hold your questions until the end of John's presentation. Um, so that we can let him get through his presentation, uh, you know, unless perhaps they are something very specific clarification kinds of things, um, so that we can let him get through that bit. Um, so before I turn it over to... Before you do that, is there any way you can adjust our screens? They're all squatty. I... They're really hard to read that That way. would be a Richard thing. I can't do anything about your screens. Uh, we'll see if we can, can get anything, um, Maybe we could power forward in the meantime. They're all squished. <laughs> all looks fine over here. Yeah, Is that better? No. It's just going to be small, Michelle, I think. Okay, well. 
Can you just make the screen bigger? Oh, that's, that's a better. better. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. I don't think it's a Zoom setting. I think um, given that the space above and below the picture is dead They're space. all like that. Yeah. yeah. That's a little better. Full screen? Okay, that's that better? better? A little, yeah. About the same. Is that better? It's about the same, but it's, a it's okay. Better. It's a little better. Yeah. <laughs> Each monitor is separate. Oh, um, well, Glenn, you can share my screen and copy if you want to. Just next to it. Just get a picture of this thing real quick. I couldn't find it. It's on the city. Mm. It's on the city's website. That's where we ended up being. Is it agenda for mm -hmm. commencement? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I mean, I don't even see an option to change my view once I'm in screen share mode. And there's all the views that it would allow me. It could be the resolution of, of something with Sorry, the screen. Go to screen. And then go up to the one set. Like video no. settings. Because people keep changing. Could be that. Screen. Could be a video setting. Right. Okay. You could try uh, HD. No, that's the camera. No, no. Um, Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. HD. Mm -hmm. In that case, I would like more light over us and make sure we can yeah. see. Uh, can you change? Have to restart Zoom. No worries. Can you open on your tablet? Can you pick it up with your tablet? Scale to fish. Why would you do that? Does that? I think it's a monitor setting because all the changes you guys are making in Zoom are staying, the Zoom window is the same size. It's not filling the monitor. I don't even have his slides in. Oh boy, could we could we move forward, yeah. do you think? Let's let's move forward. I've got a tablet. I'll, I'll bring it up on my tablet. Barbara has a tablet. I have a spare There's printed copy. No, there. printed copy. There's two Mark. printed copies. We always have the, uh, the projector if we need that as well. Can you say got it? I thought it's that showing me. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank the public for their patience with that. It's uh, going to be a little hard for us, but we will try to power through it. Uh, go ahead, uh, Adrian. Thank you. So before I turned it over to John, I just wanted to briefly mention uh, the Dark Skies survey that was done um, in mid-September through mid-October. Um, we had 173 total responses to the survey. Um, and I know this is way too much text on the screen, especially for your small screens, um, but I wanted to just um, sh highlight a kind of summary of um, what, what the subcommittee thought was really representative of the overall responses through the survey. So out of 92 total responses to this open-ended question, uh, about two thirds, 63 of them were concerned about lighting issues and support and or supportive of the regulation sentiments along those lines. Um, about 24 or close to a quarter, maybe a little over a quarter in, in this case, um, were opposed to the regulation or concerned that it would have no impact or some other, you know, uh, concerns about crime, safety, um, some of those kinds of situations. So I've specifically asked John, um, John saw the entire, the, the survey results, and we specifically asked John to provide some background that helped to, would help to address 
some of these concerns, um, really shed some light on some of the basics about why we're moving forward with this ordinance and um, addressing some of these significant public concerns about crime and safety and other impacts that we might expect. So I wanted to provide that context before John goes into his presentation so you kind of have an understanding of why he's covering some of those topics. Oops, so with that, I am actually going to stop share. Um, John, thank you for joining us. Um, let me know if you have the ability to share your screen right now, or if not. Okay, and can you hear me? We can. Great, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. We yes. can, we're, um, we're still seeing it in the kind of editing mode though. Yep. Yeah, how there about now, full screen, great. Okay, uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee and also the community members that are present, um, I want to thank you for this opportunity to address you tonight and to respond to some of the concerns that were raised during the community survey and hopefully um, give you a sense of confidence that the road that we're headed down here is the right one for Brisbane uh, and that we are really doing due diligence to try to make this the best code that it can be in a way that addresses these concerns. So as Adrian mentioned, uh, she asked me to prepare about 10 or maybe 15 minutes at most for you uh, on some topics that came up as themes in the survey, give you some factual information. And at the end, I'm gonna give you a link to a report that was recently published by Dark Sky International, which is the sort of authority NGO on this topic, where if you want to dig more into the, the evidence and the science behind all of this, uh, that you can get to that report uh, and learn more about any of these topics. Uh, what we've been proceeding from in the from the beginning here are a set of, of very simple principles that have emerged in the last about 10 to 15 years as a best practice in outdoor lighting in a way that attends to the security and safety concerns that communities have, along with the need to reduce light pollution for some reasons that I'll mention in a moment. And it's really common sense if we get down to these very, very simple six principles here uh, that really target light to where it's needed in the times and places that it is needed in the right amounts uh, in the colors that are best for the environment and for people and to observe the idea that uh, your light should stay in your property so that we don't cause neighbor complaints. And so this, this is what has been going into the formulation of the ordinance as a kind of a prescription and we've pulled examples uh, from uh, lots of codes from other places that address all these concerns. So you'll hear me come back to some of these ideas as we step through these topics. So the first one that I wanna uh, talk about because this after all is a, a committee that's concerned about open space and ecology um, is ecology and the environment. What effect does all of this light have on wildlife and how can we address these concerns through the code? Um, we know that artificial light at night, which is the cause of light pollution, uh, harms essentially all the species that scientists have studied so far to date. There are about 160 that we can find in the scholarly literature. And they are seeing effects on wildlife, on plants and animals, insects, et cetera, uh, from the level of individuals all the way up to populations. And it's affecting many different uh, kinds of species. I wanted to point out these three particular examples because I think they're relevant to your area, um, particularly being a coastal environment and that we know that that's an emerging area of research right now. We're finding out that the light emitted from sources onshore is affecting the ecology far out to sea uh, so that the cities on coasts are having an impact on their neighboring uh, ocean that is outsized relative to the, the populations of people that they serve. Uh, to the extent that you have a, a community of migratory bird species, we know that they're very definitely impacted by light pollution uh, in severe ways that is causing harm to certain species that are, um, are already under stress for a variety of other reasons. And a lot of pollinating insects that pollinate our food crops do their work for us at night and artificial light can very easily draw them off of their uh, paths that they're trying to find the plants that they need to pollinate. 
And uh, as I kind of alluded to, this is piling stress onto all of these systems that they're already feeling because of climate change and biodiversity loss and changes to habitat. Um, and you add all that up and it's no longer just sort of a niche concern anymore. A lot of conservationists are very concerned about the impacts that all this light is having and what it is doing to our plant animal life. There are concerns about the extent to which light pollution is affecting human health. Um, this is a, a, a very difficult topic to navigate through in the literature for the least of which reason that most people get most of their light exposure in indoor environments. And so outdoor lighting probably is a lesser concern here. The picture that I'm showing you suggests why light is potentially harmful to people. And it has to do with the so-called circadian rhythm that takes about 24 hours to complete. And a lot of the timing of our biological processes as humans, um, and this affects other animals too, but particularly us, uh, is really timed to the natural cycle of light and dark. So when we're putting light into the biological system at a time that it's not expected, it really begins to challenge all of those systems. And when things get out of balance, laboratories uh, studies suggest in, in individuals and small populations that this is responsible for metabolic disorders, uh, potentially things like obesity, diabetes, certain kinds of cancer, especially uh, breast and prostate cancer seem to be very strongly affected by light exposure at night. Uh, we see correlations when we look at larger populations. If we match up light at night that we see on satellite images of the earth with the incidences of certain diseases like those cancers, we see a pretty strong correlation even after we account for lifestyle factors. So we think there's a strong signal there. But again, the, the concern that, that this light is somehow causing uh, an epidemic of disease is probably not the case. Uh, but we want to try to limit this excess light exposure as much as possible, given that, again, a lot of people get their light exposure, majority of which from, uh, comes from, from indoor spaces. We don't know what the safe exposure threshold is. Sometimes regulators will ask what that, uh, that might be. Uh, and until we know that, I think we, we have to just proceed with caution, as we would in any case where we didn't have all the answers. Of course, uh, public safety is an important consideration. A lot of people uh, noted that they were concerned that pursuing dark sky would mean that the community would be less safe. Um, I can tell you unambiguously that using outdoor lighting very carefully saves lives on roads. There is no doubt about that. When we put lights in places that um, are called conflict zones where different kinds of traffic come together, Think about intersections where you have vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, that lighting those spaces at night definitely improves public safety and reduces collisions and deaths. So no one is going to suggest that we need to turn off uh, street lighting at intersections or anything like that because we know that that's very effective in improving public safety. Um, that said, a lot of streets are overlit relative to international recommendations. And what I'm showing you in particular here is some lighting that was done through the Northwest um, Energy Alliance and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory about 10 years ago that looked at uh, the braking distance and reaction times of drivers under different lighting conditions and found that you get the most benefit at around 35 miles an hour under which your headlights on your vehicle are much better at showing you obstacles in the road than overhead lighting. And that's particularly true when traffic densities are low. So there's a question as to whether we even need lighting in certain situations when the lights that we carry with us might do the job better. Not to say that we're going to eliminate um, street lighting, but uh, it's worth taking a look at the way we light our streets now and making sure that we've set the lighting level appropriately given those variables so that we maximize safety and we don't inadvertently cause problems with very bright light, for example, that can create glare that's distracting to drivers and disorienting to pedestrians and bicyclists. Another consideration that we we're still learning about is how all of this impacts energy use and climate, and increasingly a concern about the energy independence of our country. We've tried to do everything we can, of course, to eliminate wasted energy so as to reduce dependence on foreign sources of energy and to reduce our impact on uh, the global climate. 
These are some uh, numbers that come from both the, the scholarly literature and estimates made by Dark Sky International and the U.S. Department of Energy to suggest exactly how much light is wasted in the United States each year. And it's a, a really incredible amount, relatively speaking, upward of uh, four and a half billion dollars was their estimate for the year 2021. Um, and the center graphic there uh, illustrates why that's so important. So much of that light is simply wasted in the sense that it doesn't serve a, a purpose. It doesn't illuminate places and times where people need that illumination in order to uh, be able to see to move about safely at night. Um, and they found out that there would be significant savings above and beyond that waste if we just used more smart controls with our lighting so that it is better targeted to those needs. And to the extent that we're still using a lot of fossil fuels to produce our electricity, it's worth remembering that all of this energy waste from outdoor lighting that's uh, not very fit for purpose is indirectly contributing to carbon emissions that are uh, increasing the tendency towards global climate change. People also wonder about how light interacts with crime and they fear that they will be less safe and secure in a town where uh, dark sky lighting principles are put into practice. Um, I can tell you that the, the data on this are very mixed and it's a result of a lot of studies that really aren't designed very well. They don't take into account the other kinds of variables that might influence the uh, rate at which crimes are perpetrated. I can tell you with some pretty reliable results that uh, if we're talking about the extent to which people feel safe, if they, you know, they're not going to be out on the street at night if they don't feel comfortable in those spaces. And I'm showing you some research uh, on the left that was performed in um, some Israeli cities a few years ago where they looked at the effect of what the researchers called feelings of safety reported by people that participated in the study when they went from no light on city streets, which is at the far left, to progressively more light as you move along those colored curves to the right. And the important thing to note here is that you get a big increase in the perception of, of safety when you go from no light to a very small amount. But then that quickly flattens out and you can go up to much higher levels that are beginning to more resemble indoor lighting uh, illumination. Um, but people don't feel more safe as a result as to whether that those feelings of safety translate into actual security, it's, it's very mixed. It looks like in some cases it probably does help. And in other cases, it may actually, uh, by putting a lot of bright light into the world, we may be indirectly increasing the tendency towards the perpetration of crime because we're making it easier for criminals to operate at night. And despite those feelings, the picture on the right, I think, is really powerful. And it shows two views of the same scene taken with the same camera settings of a typical residential lighting situation in the U.S. where somebody has a very bright porch light on the outside of their home. And it's only when the uh, photographer reaches out with his hand and, and blocks that light, effectively shielding it, that you see that there is somebody standing in the, the open gate. And the glare directly into the camera lens until that point prevents you from seeing that person. So what we're aiming for here is better nighttime visibility with this code so that we're putting the light where it's needed and people make efficient use of it to be able to see these circumstances before they walk into them, rather than just having light blasted everywhere that might be a detriment to, uh, to public safety and security. People have asked about the color of lighting. Uh, we're recommending so-called warmer colors that are illustrated by that series of lamps in the picture on the right. All of those lamps are considered to be white light sources, but they can tend toward warmer or cooler colors depending upon this thing called color temperature that we discuss in the code draft. There's a scale on the left indicating the sort of range of colors that we think are best in terms of both human health as well as the well-being of wildlife. And what's really important is that those colors are sufficient to show you the colors of objects well. That's a complaint we sometimes hear from law enforcement, that they can't differentiate colors very well in the field, which can uh, work against them. But increasingly, 
even lighting products down at these warmer colors are able to get good, what we call a color rendering index, the, the degree to which they accurately render the colors of objects. So we think there's a win-win here. There's no known impact on safety or cost. It's simply another um, option that you choose at the time that you purchase lighting. There's a concern also about shielding of lights by which we mean uh, attaching uh, uh, physical materials onto light fixtures in order to better direct where that light goes. For the purpose of reducing harm to the environment, we're trying to keep that light on the ground as much as possible and out of the night sky. So we argue for what we call fully shielded lighting that's pictured here as, as the best where the sources recessed up into the, the shade or the shield here that makes sure that the lighting stays on the ground and doesn't go above that 90 degree angle indicated over there on the right. Uh, it reduces glare, it improves the visibility because now there's more light illuminating the scene and the target rather than ending up directly in the viewer's eye. And here too, by moving to that fully shielded standard, we don't know of any evidence in the literature suggesting that there's any negative impact to safety. And it's also something that's just another option at the time that you purchase a lighting. And it's uh, I've never seen where there was some kind of premium attached to purchasing lighting that was fully shielded versus the versions over there on the left that are either partially or unshielded and have uh, more of a detrimental impact on the night sky. Some people have asked about uh, what we would call in the industry over lighting prevention, uh, also known as lumens caps. This is where we try to put limits on the total amount of light emission on a property. So as to avoid situations like this one in the picture where there's a, a very intense illumination over the roadway here, but then you can see it, it pretty quickly falls off on either side. So transitions from the lit area to the unlit area are very quick and they don't really allow the eye to adjust to the difference. Uh, it's arguable that in a picture like this, there's vastly more light being put on the roadway surface than is really needed, especially given that in this picture, there's no traffic on that road at all. So the idea here is back to those principles at the beginning of my presentation, we're trying to make sure that we set the light level correctly so that it's adequate for the purpose. It's neither too little nor too much. And we do this by limiting the amount of light that can be installed on a parcel uh, relative to the type of land use so that we're making sure that, it, that it's, the allowance is adequate and that we're giving people a, a, a fair chance to light their property correctly, but while not going overboard to the point that we're wasting light and also potentially creating uh, a safety hazard. And somewhat related to that uh, is the notion of, of lighting curfews, where we ask that after a certain hour, lighting is either dimmed or extinguished completely in cases that it's not strictly necessary. Uh, certainly, we're not talking about extinguishing street lighting or anything of that nature, where there's a very clear safety uh, component to it. Uh, but there's a lot of lighting out there in the world that uh, at two in the morning, let's say, there's no one around to use it. Uh, and it can be argued that it really is waste at that point. And we don't want to prevent people from lighting when there's a good need for it. But during those overnight hours, when the need is generally not there, what we're asking for is to have that lighting reduced or if it makes sense, simply turn it off. And a great way to deal with this is to use controls like motion sensors. Um, that's something that a lot of, of law enforcement that I've talked to uh, says is really valuable because it brings the element of surprise. So if we're talking about security situations where we wanna make sure that people are not up to no good during the overnight hours, uh, uh, as one um, police officer I talked to once put it, uh, when that light comes on, you don't know if it's a motion sensor or it's the owner uh, standing there at the switch. And, and so that's something that can have a deterrent effect uh, in neighborhoods where lighting that's on motion sensors is pretty common. So those are the, the few things that I wanted to mention and I'll just leave this up here for a second. If you wanna know more about this, uh, working with Dark Sky International, I've done a real deep dive into this. All of the, uh, the evidence basis for the things I've been talking about coming from the scientific literature, uh, written in a way that it, it's non-technical, it's easy to approach and understand and it has an extensive citation list 
And you can find it either by scanning that QR code there uh, or going to that short link. And uh, anybody who wants the report, I will be happy to send you a PDF of that. Uh, so with that, I'll stop my screen share and I will hand it back to Adrian. Great. Thank you, John. Very much appreciated. Um, uh, before we get into questions from my committee members, I'm wondering if we could get AV, the AV personnel to help with the, this particular monitor. Um, I think it's, I think it's, hard over here. So while we're doing question and answers, we can manage our microphone use, but we probably won't need to look at charts. So I think that's a good time before we go into the dark skies ordinance, because I know the font on those charts is pretty small. Um, and with that, uh, John, I would like to first thank you for all of your time consulting with the dark skies subcommittee and staff on our draft ordinance and also for attending tonight and giving that great briefing. Um, I. I've got the mic, so I'm just going to keep it. Uh, so I think that your uh, your photos during the crime and security um, slide were very compelling about how sometimes glare makes it harder to see things than, than what people intend with their security lighting. So I definitely appreciate it. And I believe my colleague to the right, Barbara, had a question. Yeah, um, I, I've been working on this for several years, and I want to thank you very much for weighing in and, and giving us that push we needed to get over the hump. And, and without you, it's, this wouldn't be happening, and I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, we had, uh, I was just wondering, because this question has been put, put out there, um, do you feel it's necessary to do a baseline study before enacting some kind of dark skies ordinance? Uh, can you clarify for me when you say baseline study, what what do you mean by that? Just so I'm sure. Um, we had a member of our community who, who felt that, that we shouldn't do this without doing sort of like a survey of environmental and biological impacts um, before we, we embarked upon this. And, and I, I sort of have my feelings about that, but um, I'd like you as an expert to address that. Sure. I, I, I would not necessarily recommend that as a matter of course for any community that was looking into this unless there was reason to believe that you had some special circumstance. So let's say, uh, you know, the city was directly adjacent to a very biologically sensitive area like a nature preserve or something like that. And I know that there's, there's land that's set aside for that as open space in Brisbane. Um, or if you knew you had a, a particularly sensitive wildlife population. Uh, but I think you can proceed with many of these ideas, which are the things we've been putting into the, uh, the code draft, I, are, are pretty well road tested at this point. Uh, a question that's related to that is whether some sort of, of measurement campaign should be made for the quality of the night sky as an indicator of lighting on the ground. And if you were not in a major metro area, I might recommend that. But my guess is that the brightness of your night sky is more determined by the other Bay Area communities around you and not so much by the light coming from Brisbane itself. Not to say there's no influence at all, uh, but if you're looking for some sort of, of evidence uh, before and after that the code changes are making a difference in that regard, it's going to be tough to discern in the data. So I wouldn't discourage you from considering it, but I don't feel that it's a prerequisite in order to uh, proceed with the ideas that we've put into the code because they've, they're increasingly becoming common uh, for a lot of municipalities of Brisbane's size. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very good, very useful. So. If I understand what you're saying correctly, you're saying that the benefits from something like this would be local, and that's really how it should be presented to the public, the benefits to local pollinators, local wildlife, and neighbors. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, I do feel that way, uh, that it, it really should be framed in that sense, because the strongest effect, and we've seen this recur in multiple studies, is on a kind of a micro level. Of course, in the broader dark sky movement, we hope that, you know, every town in America would uh, adopt 
these kinds of, of ordinances and that we would overall start to see the, the national trend move. But I think the greatest positive benefit that you will see uh, will be on the local level. And I really emphasize that, especially with anything that's related to visibility at night. So the concerns about public safety and crime and all of that will have the greatest effect locally. Yeah, because in the same survey that Barbara was referring to, another respondent, maybe more than one, was saying, well, you know, we live in a big metro region and what Brisbane does is not really going to have any effect on the night sky. So why should we do it? So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and I, I would absolutely recommend that setting the night sky aside, there are really great reasons for doing this that I believe will benefit your community. Even, even here in Brisbane, where we are surrounded by um, a large urban area, I notice a really a difference in what I can see in the night sky at, say, 8 p.m. as opposed to 3 a.m. in the morning when a lot of uh, the extraneous lights are turned out. You can see many more stars. You can see constellations and things like that, um, even though there is still a lot of uh, sky glow from the surrounding areas. So really Brisbane, because uniquely because of its bowl shaped, um, has an even greater impact with between the lights that are local and the lights that are regional um, on the night sky and on your uh, ability to be able to um, see things. So it really does make a difference here because of our unique uh, topography. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have one question. Oh, go for it. So could you talk a little bit more just about human health and the circadian rhythms? I was very fascinated by the chart that you put up, and I hope you'll share that uh, presentation with us because uh, um, the, the health benefits of uh, darker sleep, especially, you know, is there a lot of research on that for human health as well as, you know, animal and migratory health? There is. I'm glad that you asked that question. Uh, and and to, <laughs> to make a long story short, the way this works in, in us as people and in, in all other animals as well is that there's a roughly 24-hour cycle that's called the circadian rhythm that governs the biological activity of, of certain systems and it mostly has to do with uh, signaling pathways. So at, at night, our bodies are doing different things than they are during the day. And of course, the length of the day changes during the course of the year, and we need to be able to adjust for that, and we do it with light. So the way that the body knows what time it is, essentially, is by light that comes in through the eyes, but makes its way directly into a part of the brain that kind of functions like a clock. It's like a master clock in the body. And that signal then propagates out to all the different systems throughout the body, the different systems that, that control our biology. And they have what they've called peripheral clocks that all refer back to the, the master clock in the brain, which again is, is set once a day by exposure to light with certain colors and especially blue light. You wouldn't think it necessarily, but there's a lot of blue in sunlight and seeing the sunlight in the morning is the cue that tells the body essentially roughly 14 hours from now, it's time to get sleepy and go to bed. So you can see what would happen if we start exposing the eyes and the brain at night when it's supposed to be dark outside to light that has something like the color of sunlight, which starts to tell the body, wait a minute, your, your signal is wrong for the clock. You've got the wrong time. Let's reset it. A lot of the insomnia that people experience routinely is probably due to getting doses of light in the evening hours that are higher than one would expect in nature and kind of look superficially like sunlight. And especially staring at screens uh, is a great way to get that kind of light. So what we're trying to do is minimize the disruption that that's causing by bringing our uh, circadian rhythm more back into alignment with that rhythm of, of 24 hours established by day and night. Uh, that is, it's, a, it's very old in our evolutionary history 
and we see it across uh, the whole biological world. It's not unique to us or unique to mammals. Uh, even plants experience a, a 24 hour cycle like we do. Um, so again, we, we're not suggesting here that you know streetlights are giving people cancer or anything like that. We have no such evidence, but we are concerned that as a, a lifestyle matter, all this exposure to light at night is increasingly recognized as harmful to people and so to the extent that we can limit excess light exposure by reducing it in outdoor spaces, thinking about it coming through people's windows at night with inadequate window coverings, they don't have blackout shades, they're getting a signal that's telling the body it's daytime, you should be awake, you should be doing daytime things. And that seems to be harmful to people when that exposure is chronic over a long period of time. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, I've got uh, one more. I would like to give a shout out to our resident photographer, Dan Ryan, for the great image of Brisbane that you chose to use in the background of your PowerPoint presentation. So thanks, thanks, Dan. Adrian, anything else? I don't have anything. I think we're probably ready to go ahead and run through the draft of the ordinance at this point in time. So give me a sec, we'll share screen. I will note that as John has been presenting, my Zoom and internet connection seems to have become a little bit unstable. So I'm hoping that it's going to hold up while I am sharing the screen here. Adrian, since we're working off paper copies, would it be okay to have a little bit more light up here? Or uh, I'm going to, I'm Richard has the control for that. So I'm going to have to ask him to uh, <laughs> adjust it or bring it to us. And while we're working on that, can you move that little inset of us maybe to the very lowest far right corner where I think that's where the least information is going to happen? Ah, ooh, maybe not that bright. Add <laughs> a little. Can you adjust the correlated color temperature on that too? <laughs> Getting better? Can you bring it down just a little? That's, oh that's really bright. <laughs> oh, I like it. That's needlework. That's good. No, back up, back up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say, we don't know. <laughs> A little bit higher. Up. These lights up maybe and the audience lights down? Does that work? Yeah. And let's just go on. The front up down a little. <laughs> Yeah, we, we have limited <laughs> control <It's all> right. <laughs> for the <laughs> options here. <laughs> Stop. Good. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Let's save that setting. <laughs> Lovely. All right, I'm going to get going. Uh, so what we're going to present in the next 10-ish um, slides is an outline of the draft Dark Skies Ordinance done by the committee. Um, this is uh, Barbara Eberl and Michelle Salmon, uh, or my colleagues on the committee. Uh, our staff help was Adrian Etherton, uh, our summer intern, Rachel Reagan. I think that was her last name. Thank you. Um, and then two members from the Planning Commission, Julia Ayers and Jeremiah Robbins also helped us a lot. Planning staff, not Planning Commission. Thank you, Planning yes. staff. And then we also had input from uh, the Dark Skies consultant we just heard from, John Barentin. Very much appreciated. Um, uh, I also think that we've, we've had uh, input from various community members on the time uh, along the way, so we should acknowledge that who've, you know, chirped up. So absolutely. Thank you. And, and one more point maybe to make before we go into the details is that this has also been reviewed by the public works director, the community development director, code enforcement, police, fire, and legal. So it has been through basically all the rounds of staff, I believe. Thank you. Glenn, uh, did you have? Yeah, I was going to ask, have the council liaisons seen this? Because I was very impressed. We met with um, the Invasive Species Subcommittee met yesterday with city staff and council liaisons. It was very useful. So I was wondering, have you done that? We had a Zoom meeting with them. It feels like a year ago. Yeah. Okay. It's been a while. Okay. Um, yeah. And Glenn, you arrived a little late. Uh, in the interest of time, 
we were going to ask for all questions to be held to the end. Um, that's that's an example of a question that doesn't necessarily need to, but because this builds and builds, a lot of the questions people might ask would show up in a later chart. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate but, it. But it was yeah. relevant here. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, so on this chart, we're just showing the outline of the ordinance and the things that are in bold we have slides on tonight. Uh, so next slide, this is the purpose. Um, there's a lot of words here and uh, I don't wanna belabor it because John went into a lot of this, um, but I will hit the highlights. Uh, the first one is we wanna prevent excessive lighting and minimize light pollution. Uh, next bullet, we wanna reclaim views of the night sky. Next bullet, we want to promote wildlife habitation and migration. Next bullet, we want to provide sufficient lighting where it is needed to promote safety and security. That is in our purpose. Next, we want to allow flexibility in the style of outdoor lighting. And then the final three are kind of sustainability related. We want to um, provide standards that balance energy use and economic input. We want to provide lighting standards that may evolve according to advancements in technology. And we wanna promote lighting practices which conserve energy, decrease dependence on fossil fuels, and limit greenhouse gases. Next chart. Uh, so applicability. Um, pretty much immediately after the effective date of the ordinance, all outdoor lighting that is installed or replaced must comply with the ordinance. Um, existing lighting has a a uh, more lenient compliance schedule. So we'll get to that in a future chart, but I did wanna make that clear now that we're not expecting everyone to change all of their lighting immediately. Uh, what's not covered in the ordinance is indoor lighting, uh, lighting that's used temporarily for construction or emergency reasons, uh, address identification lighting, which is what the fire department needs to see your house, it's important. Uh, low intensity landscape lighting, so this is kind of where we put the solar path lights as an example, they're just very low intensity, so they'd be very hard to cover. Um, lighting that is regulated by a higher authority, it's called preempted in the ordinance. And so this would be like Coast Guard navigation lights, other lighting of that in, um, uh, use. Um, let's see, short-term lighting that is exempt from discretionary or min ministerial permitting by the city. So this is, you know, you you're having a block party and you, you put a light on the street and it's there for a couple hours and the party ends and you take that off. Um, combustible fuel lighting, uh, when it is used temporarily in occupied areas. So that could be a fire pit or a, a tiki torch or whatever. Um, and then finally, uh, fire alarm notification obviously uh, has an important use and is not uh, covered in the dark, this draft dark skies ordinance. Next chart. This is where it gets fun. Um, so, this section, we'll call it subsection 50, is the lighting levels by zoning district. It's what John called the lighting cap uh, or lumen cap or lumen allowance. Um, so Brisbane has uh, different zones. And so we have made different lumen allowances for the open space zone, the um, uh, residential zone, commercial zone, uh, the other zone, um, and so what's going on in, these, in this table is we have a column that gives us a lumen per square, lumen per square foot of hardscape. Uh, that applies to the open space zone, the commercial zone, and the others. Um, and hardscape is defined at the bottom, but it's basically all of the non-vegetated, non-occupied buildings. So it's the parking lots, driveways, decks, et cetera. Um, and then in the next column, it's similar. It's the residential allotment. Um, and that is um, based on the square feet of developed lot area. And so it's, it's kind of similar covered or occupied structures, um, finished surfaces such as slabs or deck um, and that's within seven feet of, oh, oh, with seven feet of clearance above it. Sorry about that. Um, you will see that there's also curfew set for residential and commercial, and those curfews do not include lighting activated by motion sensor. Um, and then commercial lighting also includes illuminating signage. So uh, the curfews are very important uh, in this ordinance. And I think 
that is all I need to go through. Oh, one more thing that I didn't mention. I'm not sure John hit it. Uh, lumen, it's a measure of light from a lamp. Uh, it is not the same as a watt, but a really good idea, a really good way of thinking about how much a lumen is, is that a 50 watt incandescent, which we all grew up with, uh, is roughly 1500 lumens. Uh, okay, next chart. So the previous chart had the lumen cap that was based on zoning district. This chart is the citywide requirements that applies, you know, uh, applies across the whole city. Um, so citywide, all outdoor light fixtures shall be fully shielded except for string lights. Um, and it didn't make it onto this chart, but that's when they're in use in an occupied deck or patio. So they're not all night long lighting. Uh, seasonal lighting, Brisbane stars, and US or flag lighting, however, that is uh, expected to be shielded so that you can't see the light source directly from a, a different property. Uh, light trespass, which is seeing a lamp directly from another property is prohibited. Um, and then there's a few restrictions. First, there's no lighting around the perimeter of a site unless it is motion controlled and turns off 10 minutes act after activation. Um, you, there is, um, <clears throat> Lighting has to be within 50 feet of residentially ha habitable buildings or swimming pools, driveways, and walkways for residences. And um, there is a security, an exception for security lighting um, in this location um, restriction, but that has to be determined by a building official. Um, there is a cap on the correlated color temperature of all lighting. It's uh, that three, it has to be less than 3000 Kelvin, which is kind of a warm white. And then the curfews in the previous table um, include seasonal lighting and those are citywide. Um, and for a commercial that requires a automated control system. So motion sensor, whatever, and, and a 10 minute timer. Next chart. There are a couple uh, special use cases. Uh, street lights is a big one. Um, I'm gonna jump around with bullets. I'll hit the second one first. For each street light, the lumen output needs to be the lowest possible to meet safety standards and can't be more than 10,000 lumens max. Um, the street lights, lamps will be replaced upon burnout uh, and the new lamps will meet the color temperature and lumen output requirements. And then going to the acorn lights um, that I'm sure we're all familiar with, they, they line a bunch of streets in town. Um, those are not subject to shielding until they're replaced at which point the replacements must be fully shielded and comply with the ordinance. Uh, the next kind of special use case is recreational athletic field facilities. Um, those follow a uh, specific guidance from the Illuminating Engineering Society. Uh, the field lighting is to be used exclusively for surface, um, the surface of play, so the field and viewing stands and no other applications. Um, the illuminance levels are to be based on the task. So what you need for active play might be different than the guy that's spray painting chalk on the side of the baseball field. Um, Off-site impacts need to be limited to the greatest extent possible. That's kind of a, a light pollution thing. Uh, and then this is, this is the smart one. Sorry, if they're all smart. Uh, lights need to be out by 8 p.m. except when being used for active play and equipped with a timer. And so that timer is gonna keep the lights from being left on automatically, which is a major source of pollution. Next chart. We're almost there. Uh, deviation procedures. So, so the deviations uh, to the ordinance must be approved by the community development director or the public works director. Um, I'm gonna jump third bullet now. Um, they're to be granted if there are unique circumstances that make it infeasible or impractical to comply with the DSO. However, they have to comply to the maximum extent feasible. So the application will include a site plan and a lighting plan and a description on why the deviation is needed. Uh, if a deviation is granted, it will be publicly noticed on the three city bulletin boards and the website and mailings to the owners within a 300 foot radiance. Um, if someone wants to appeal that deviation, they would appeal to the city manager and that would that hearing would get noticed. Next chart. Now, uh, compliance schedules. Um, so we're proposing that the easy fixes be done within a year for the non-conforming lighting. 
Uh, so if you have a bulb that or a fixture that can be directed downward, do so. If you have the way to dim, you're gonna, gonna wanna dim to, the, to minimize the glare and the light trespass in your neighbor's properties. Um, if it's equipped with a motion sensor, uh, that needs to be extinguished 10 minutes af after activation. And if your lamps can be removed, uh, not all can, but some can, uh, replacing the bulbs to meet the color temperature and lumen thresholds is another thing you can do within that, that easy first year. There are some things that will be harder, uh, replacing fixtures, uh, moving lights, and so those have different compliance timelines for non-residential areas, that's five years, for residential areas, it's 10, and for the street lights in the city facilities, it's 15 years. Um, the reason for that is the cost. Adrian? That. Yeah, I did want to address this because we, uh, I spent quite a bit of time looking into uh, the impacts of this on the city. Um, and we are estimating that between streetlights, specifically conversion of the acorn lights, um, as well as um, updates to other city facilities, um, most likely the, the other big one is going to be the ball fields at Mission Blue. We're looking at an estimate of a million dollars or perhaps more of, of cost impacts to the city to do that. Those acorn lights are probably going to be somewhere in the range of $3,000 a piece to replace with compliant lighting. So we think we need a good amount of time to be able to spread that cost out and, um, you know, not that we would wait till the end of 15 years to do it, but that um, that getting through that million dollar or mm -hmm. likely more cost um, will will probably take some time. We want to be able to get that into the city's capital improvement program and deal with the you know fluctuations in budget and fiscal cycles and and be able to accommodate that. So wanted to kind of address that up front. Perfect. And then the last thing on this chart, which is the last chart for me, I believe, uh, is that extensions obviously are something that we feel would, would be need to be granted to folks who have a significant financial or other hardship. Um, and so what they need to do is just request uh, an extension to the community development director 90 days before the deadline, and then that, that extension would be given for no more than a year, and it's also appealable. Um, do you have a couple charts on the survey, Adrian? Is that next? Yes. Oh, the stars. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we want to go straight to that or if we'd like to start um, with questions from the committee about what you just ran through. Um, I will note we do have um, someone who from the public who has joined us on Zoom. So I want to make sure we provide an opportunity to get public comment. Um, but I think Typically, we would take questions first and then public comment and then discussion. Okay. Uh, before we go into questions from OSAC, I would love to give Barbara and Michelle a minute as well because I just dominated with that very long presentation. And so uh, if you guys have anything to say before we open it up for questions, it seems like a great time. Back to you. Um, I'm not sure what I should say. Um, I mean, I think that we've all worked really hard on this and we've really tried to um, anticipate and listen to the community and the community concerns. As a matter of fact, there's a couple of things um, I think I might suggest um, at some point tonight or just that we could roll around um, when it comes to the correct, correct thing. But um, we've really tried to... Um, focus in on the low hanging fruit and the biggest bang for the buck, the things that are like easy to do, like swapping out light bulbs and, um, you know, give, give more time for changing out fixtures so that we're not wasting resources or people's money or time um, unnecessarily. And just like I said, just really tried to focus in on making this um, the most yield we can while still making it low impact, comp some compromises were made there, you know. And um, I also think we uh, need to rename this. It is not truly a dark, I think just dark sky, calling it darker skies ordinance is misleading. People feel like they're going to, all the lights are going to be turned out on them. And this isn't even close to that. I think um, a lot of us who are environmentally sensitive feel like it doesn't go quite far enough, but um, 
we really tried. We really have tried to do the best for our community. And um, I'm totally happy if anybody has specific concerns to to address them. Um, but, you know, okay, that's enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it was because I wanted a dark skies ordinance that I got talked into being on OSEC over 12 years ago. So this has long been an agenda point for me. I'm, I've am i been so tired of Crocker Industrial Park looking like close encounters of the third kind and the ball filled at Mission Blue on half the night illuminating all of the mountain. So this has been a long time in coming and it was extra long and Barbara's done a lot of work on this, especially when a year ago we scrapped the ordinance that we were doing because we got... Um, uh, feedback that we would not be able to enforce a uh, certifiable dark skies ordinance. There's a lot of compromises in this uh, ordinance that I wouldn't have made. And there are some things that I still would like us to change. I don't think that it's uh, reasonable for us to expect others to comply in certain timeframes when the city itself is not is not willing to do that in particular about the street lights. I think that we can start a phased approach of uh, addressing the worst issues right away. Um, I also think that there are some things that we still should uh, look at in the ordinance and maybe uh, adjust. I've had a lot of commentary after we put out the uh, survey of people who are like this, that, or the other thing. And you know, in particular, there's little things like for instance, construction or emergency lighting um, being exempt, but they can still do the best they can to point things downward and that type of thing. So we really are looking for feedback. Um, and a lot. Uh, someone asked me, well, what about big outdoor signs? I'm like, we have a sign ordinance already. And so we didn't cover that in this at that extent. So this, is, this has been a tremendous amount of work. There's been a lot of compromises in it. Um, but I, I do think overall that we should move forward because it's only going to get worse. I did have one more thought. Um, there is, there is one kind of feedback that I, I got to admit, I'm not really interested in. And that is, well, San Francisco puts out so much light. It doesn't matter what we do. And, and we've heard from our lighting consultant that, uh, you know, a lot of the benefits are going to be local in terms of, you know, just, for our local wildlife, our local insects, um, our neighborhoods, and um, you know, it, it, that that whole argument. Well, I don't have to care because somebody's polluting in China. Exactly. Holds no water with me. So, <laughs> if, me if that's your complaint, you're going to have to talk to somebody else because yeah. I don't care. <laughs> Also, we're not the only ones, right? There's a group in, Mo in Marin yes. that's working for Dark Skies Ordinance, and Michelle has a little story to tell as well. Yeah, um, normally I don't answer my uh, cell phone if I don't know the number, but it didn't say spam. And so I answered it in the middle of the day, and it was a woman from uh, Palo Alto who well, they're working on a Dark Skies Ordinance, and they wanted to hear about ours and, and see our survey. And fortunately, we had already posted the agenda, so it was really easy for me to share that with her. Um, so, you know, even places like Palo Alto are every all up and down the peninsula, there are dark skies ordinances that are starting to happen. So although we've been at it for 12 years, there's a lot of people catching up quickly. Okay, uh, thank you. I would like to open the floor to questions from the other OSEC members. I do want to note that our member of the public does have their hand raised. So let's please try to keep this to questions at this point in time and not get too far into the discussion before we take that public comment. Very good. Thank you. Glenn. First, uh, just a thank you to the subcommittee. This obviously is a lot of work. I think you all did a really good job balancing some tricky issues. My question has to do with kind of the cost of replacing fixtures. Do, do, we, do we have any indication? Can we tell members of the public what we think it's going to cost? Do you, have you looked into at all um, whether there's some kind of um, shade mechanism that can be attached to a lot of fixtures so that people don't have to go through the whole rewiring business? 
because that, that came up in the survey that people were worried about cost and, and some resentment about having to replace fixtures in particular. Com completely reasonable. Um, so I, I mean, I, I don't think there is a easy answer on that because it probably depends on the fixture. Sure. Uh, I have an old navigation light that's you know, cute and, and antique. And I just used a piece of aluminum foil as shielding. Um, so that was a very cheap fix, but that's not going to work for everyone. I'm, I'm okay with that level of mess in my house. Um, so I think this might actually be one of the things that um, post ordinance approval education outreach is one of those things that we're, we're going to have to be on it. Um, Even pre ordinance approval. That's, that's true. That's yeah. true. <laughs> And I can see a lot of innovative solutions there. We can't really quote what costs are because costs change dramatically right. all the time. But I can see us having different workshops to address how people can um, create their own shielding and do sort of, you know, maker space type things to account for that. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, is it a good time for questions from the public? Yes, I'm going to go ahead and um, allow Dashio Leeds to go ahead and make your comment. Thanks so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dashio Leeds. I'm the conservation coordinator for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. Um, we recently found out about this ordinance when the survey was released, and what a pleasant surprise. Uh, I'm a huge dark sky nerd. I really believe in the human right to be able to see the scars at night the stars at night, and also the right of nature to exist unencumbered by artificial light at night, um, which as we know, you know, really disturbs all beings with circadian rhythms. Um, for many beings like birds, this could be fatal. Um, so we're really happy uh, that the city's developing an ordinance. Um, we are more than happy to support this ordinance, and we hope the Open Space and Ecology Committee recommends this ordinance for city council adoption. Um, you're in great company developing this ordinance. Uh, Cupertino uh, relatively recently uh, adopted a combined bird safety and dark sky ordinance. Um, as was mentioned earlier, Palo Alto is now developing an ordinance. Sunnyvale recently included dark sky policies in their recently adopted uh, Moffat Park specific plan. Um, just the other day, Los Altos City Council uh, referred their environmental commission, giving them direction to create a combined dark sky and bird safety ordinance. Um, so there's a lot of activity going on here on this topic, and I'm really excited to see um, more and more cities taking this on. This is really important. Um, so within that umbrella of broad support, I have like one suggestion and one question. Um, so first, my suggestion, um, I hope that Brisbane considers a color temperature threshold of uh, 2700 Kelvin instead of 3000 Kelvin. Um, 2700 Kelvin is the current standard that can be found in San Jose's downtown design guidelines and standards. Um, it's a little bit better for insects, so it does make a difference, and um, I, I do hope you consider it. And then uh, the second part is my question. Um, I was looking over the language regarding uh, recreational facilities and, and fields. And um, that like 8 p.m. Um, cutoff timer with motion sensors, like could anyone walking on to like a large sports field, like trigger those big lights to go on? I, maybe this is a question too granular to ask at this point, but I was just a little curious about um, how that sort of access is gonna be managed. Um, again, thank you so much for all your hard work on this and uh, we really appreciate your time and effort. Thank you, Dashiel. Um, I will address uh, your question. So um, I want to be clear, uh, my understanding at least of the guidelines um, for sports fields is not that they are on motion sensors, but that they are on some kind of uh, timer or other lighting mechanism. So someone walking across the baseball field wouldn't trigger all of the baseball field floodlights to come on, but there would be a timer that would um, allow someone, I think this actually is less likely to come into play for the baseball field and more likely to come into play for our tennis courts, where I believe we already have a uh, kind of push button uh, to turn the um, turn the lights on for the courts. So they wouldn't be on until someone came, turned the button to push the button to turn them on so they could play. And then there would be a timer that would go off after a certain amount of time uh, in case they were, you know, had left with the lights still on. Um, and I see that 
uh, John popped up and raised his hand. So I think he can probably provide more specific answer on that than I can. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that the, the specifics of the provisions for the sports lighting come directly from the uh, Dark Sky International guidelines for outdoor sports lighting that are, are uh, kind of an emergent best practice for how you do this. And that's exactly right. To, to Dashiell's there's no intention here to put anything like sports lighting on motion sensors. It's kind of the, the other way around. W what we're trying to avoid is making sure that the lights don't get left on. So you have a, a curfew hour and you say that, you know, if, if there's no play taking place after that hour, turn the lights off. If the play continues, if a game runs late, make sure that they have enough light to see what they're doing and even make some allowance, uh, if you like, for th the field maintenance, which often takes place after games end, but ensuring that at, at, at a certain time when it's reasonable that no one is left on the field, those lights will shut themselves off and they won't be allowed to remain on overnight. So that's what we're working at with those rules is, is again, to make sure that the, the light's not on all night long, rather than the light is going to turn on when anybody steps onto the field. That's not what we're after. I actually have a question about timers as well. And I know this might be a little bit overly specific, but that's kind of the thing I deal with. Um, often with timers, they're hardwired and say the power goes off and they trip and the time, the internal timer gets messed up and then they start coming on and off at random times. And then occasionally I even see, you know, on the Facebook page, oh, look at it, it's 3 a.m. I looked across and I can see the lights going on and it's not, you know, nobody's checking these and you obviously not every, you know, public works isn't checking things at 3 a.m., but um, what's, we need to have something that, that can manage that um, so that that doesn't happen on a regular basis. Because I know that really ticks off people. <laughs> I don't know if I necessarily have an immediate answer for that. I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, you know, we could look into potential battery backup for the timing system to make sure that that is not going to be impacted in a power outage um, or some other maintenance protocols post power outage in the city. These things need to be checked. Um, so we would have to look into that more to see what the options are there. Thank you. Go ahead. Fair. Regarding your question, Shanna, or, or comment, there has to be some kind of battery backup system. I have a clock radio that's about 25 years old now, and it has a battery in it. So if the power goes out overnight, the alarm still goes off when it's supposed to. So it's not a huge problem. We just have to be sure there's a battery backup. I guess the other thing I would say is if it is currently happening, probably a good opportunity for a service request. Is that my birthday? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Michelle. So I got, I, I have feedback um, that I received today that I wanted to share on a couple of things. One is apply, applicability and the construction lighting about the uh, uh, not regulated. Construction lighting can still be directed down and um, to the, uh, mitigated to the greatest extent. And I think that needs to be included in here rather than just categorically um, exempting construction lighting. Emergency lighting also can be a little bit more controlled than what it is, but especially construction lighting. Um, and then uh, we, I asked about the Brisbane School District. Well, we are not allowed to dictate to them at all because, um, but I do think that since they are part of Brisbane, we should let them know what our ordinance is for our fields and ask them to comply voluntarily. Um, the uh, lumen chart, uh, the cap chart, it, I was told it really needs to be made more simple to understand it is a little bit complex at the very least. We should have a, a key in the ordinance so that people reading it from the outside would understand what all of these different um, 
the table. The table with the all table. the zones, because it really is confusing. Um, and then one of the big ones is in uh, section 15XX060, page, starting on page five, um, item B says light trespass is prohibited, and yet it's a conflict with uh, section one where it says motion center lights uh, will extinguish no later than 10 minutes acti after activation. Those lights still need stipulations on brightness, shielding, and trespass, regardless if they're motion sensors, because one of the problems that was brought up to me that occurs a lot is people who have these motion sensor lights that go off and they stay on for 10 minutes, illuminating everything, trespass everywhere. They're not shielded, they're super bright, and they wake you up in the middle of the night when they go off in your neighborhood. And so they, those, even though they're motion sensor controlled, they should still be subject, and this should be written in here, they still should be subject uh, to the same stipulations. And on seasonal lighting, um, it was brought up that LED lighting can be extremely bright and that we should have some limitations on that. And then the issue of the street lights and um, in particular, publicly owned acorn style decorative lights, such as those on Visitation Avenue and in the Ridge neighborhood that are not subject to the shielding requirements of, sec of subsection A. And that was brought up as being um, uh, really not fair to ask the public to make these changes when the city's not willing to embark on a planned program of phased updating. And me personally, I agree with that because the acorn lights on visitation, of which there are 30, could be shielded without replacing the entire um, unit uh, with just a little bit of innovation in developing some shields. And I see eight of those 30 from my bedroom window every night, all night long until the dawn, and even sometimes after the dawn when they go out. And one of them, the second I sit up in bed, blinds me in the eye. And, and I do think that it's this, those should be addressed. And 15 years is 2038. That's 2038. Really, we should do something about it before then. Um, and there are a lot of different programs that we can do. And the, the million dollars that you quoted, Adrian, is way different than the $250 per light that you were looking at plus installation that you, we discussed. That would have been 150,000 spread across 100, uh, 300 acorn lights in the city of Brisbane. Um, so they felt that a program needs to be put in place where we actually plan, uh, have a long-term plan and replace so many lights per year uh, starting with the most egregious. And then I think uh, that was pretty much all of the things except for um, the disparity between um, the phased lighting, 15 years existing streetlights and other lighting at city facilities shall comply by 2038. Um, existing outdoor lighting and residential by 2033 existing outdoor lighting and non-residential by 2028. That's a long time away. We really should do something before then, especially after um, seeing John's chart of how much energy is lost and how much money could be saved by addressing these a lot sooner. We are in a climate crisis where I don't know that we'll see 2038 if we don't start really buckling down now. So those are my comments on it. And uh, I really appreciate all the work and all the contributions that everybody has made and all of the reviews, but I, I, I still don't think it's strict enough. Thank you. Can I address some of those? Um, so I'm gonna start with the last one first. Um, the ordinance says specifically in regard to ACORN lights, until such time as an approved program for replacement of said lights is in place. I guess I wasn't clear enough in what I meant by spreading the costs over 15 years, but yes, there would be a program that would be put in place to make those changes over that time. Um, regarding the $250 you just quoted versus the million dollars that I mentioned, uh, the $250 that I mentioned in our subcommittee 
is the cost of from the wholesaler of the shielding devices for the current lights. That's before the markup from the middleman who would actually get them from the wholesaler and taxes and installation. That's for just shielding, not actually replacing the lighting with lighting that is compliant. To do that is $2,000 wholesale cost per light plus the markup and the taxes and the installation, which is where I came to maybe it's 3000 maybe even more per light to actually replace it with fully compliant lighting. And I believe we have something on the order of 300 plus acorn lights across town. Visitation and the ridge is, you know, the bulk of that. So that's $3,000 times 300 um, something lights is $900,000 plus any other facilities. So I, that's where I'm coming up I, with that. I, I get figure. that, Adrian, and we don't need to go through the details here. I'm just giving you the feedback that I heard from one of our liaisons and plus my own feedback on 15 year timeline is, is really too long. I hear you. Okay. I've you. heard you many times. This is staff's recommendation. If the council wishes to have uh, to put forth the budget to do it over a faster timeline, certainly we can do that. I think we are trying to keep in mind the budgetary impacts. And this is what staff felt was reasonable. Um, there were a couple other comments that you made. Um, you made a lot of them, so I'm not sure if I can remember exactly all of them um, off the top of my head. Um, one of them was about construction or emergency lighting. The um, specific exemption there does include language that says, provided, however, construction or emergency lighting shall be deployed to comply with the ordinance to the greatest practical extent. So I think that does already address that idea that construction and emergency lighting doesn't have to, you know, be super bright and flooding everything. If they can shield it and direct it, um, they should. Um, but, is there, but is there any um, enforcement on that if it's, if it's uh, considered in the regulation to be outside of the regulation um, exempt? That, so we can work on that. Do you want to? If someone were to c complain and the code enforcement officer were to visit that site, I, I think it's kind of a Brisbane practice to do education first. Mm -hmm. So would they get a fine the first time? Probably no one would get a fine the very first time, but they would be educated and strongly encouraged to modify their lighting. Mm -hmm. I, you know, would they be forced to stop their work? I don't know. Probably. It was just feedback, outside feedback that I got on that one. Was there, sorry, you went th through like five or six points. I'm not sure if there was something else oh. that I was supposed to be addressing. I've, I've, I wrote down a couple as well. The table being too confusing, uh, I had to try to brief that chart today and I would like to second the uh, feeling that the table is confusing. I'm wondering perhaps if we could break it out into a residential an open space, a commercial, and an other zone. So at least people could just go to the zone that applies to them and look at their lumen budget, the direct definition of hardscape and develop lot area and curfew. And then it's gonna take more pages in the ordinance, but I feel like it would help with with a property owner who just go needs to see what they see. Is that um, I guess I will say, I feel like this is where I would probably defer to our planning staff for how ex we do have some zones that are mixed use zones. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are currently lumped in in one place or another. And so it gets a little complicated from that perspective. But I think we can probably attempt to, to do something to make it simpler and clearer. Um, I will say that it's not something that would necessarily go in the ordinance text, but we did intend that there would be educational materials that would go along with the rollout of this that would include maps that show people specifically what is allowed in their zone. 
Um, so that would be something that I think would be a, a companion to the ordinance itself that would probably help a lot of people understand this is where I am and this is how much I'm allowed to have. Um, I think we do need to have a, a large conversation about education and outreach um, as we move forward with this. And, you know, that's kind of one of the most basic points on on some of the things that would be needed to go along with it. I'm going to totally retract my suggestion on rejiggering the table because I think you're right through education and outreach that's going to clarify that a lot. But but maybe a list of definitions of what those zones are. Uh, those are defined in the zoning code, so I don't know if we would necessarily duplicate that within this ordinance, but I can ask about that as well. Because, you know, if you try to find a zoning code, you know, on the city website, it's nearly impossible. And so if you have it all together where it makes it easy for people to see and understand what those are, it might really help. It doesn't have to be part of the ordinance. Maybe it could just be... Uh, an illustration or table along with it. Or a key, just a key to... Yeah, a key. Yeah, yeah so some educational materials. I, I think we can hit that in the educational material. But one of them was, uh, one of the things was to, um, that with uh, motion lines, they still need to be uh, uh, stipulations on their brightness, shielding, and trespass. I think that might be a misread. I think they are. Uh, so you were looking at C in the city requirements. Yeah. They still have to apply to B and A and the lumen cap. I think so, it really needs to be, it doesn't seem that way when you read it. So, well, uh, yeah, I'm reading this and it seems clear to me that they would not, you know, there's no exception to any other requirements location of outdoor lighting except as required for security lighting purposes as determined by the building official the following limitations are imposed on the location of outdoor lighting lighting around the perimeter of a site is prohibited except where it is controlled by motion sensor which extinguishes the light no later than 10 minutes after activation i think i don't the, see anything in there that would lead me to think it's not compliant needing to be compliant with other things i think it's a I think it might be the except as required for security lighting purposes as what? determined by the building official. But even if it is for security lighting purposes, um, it was expressed that it should still meet the, the uh, brightness, shielding, and trespass. Yeah, so C, C is only about location. Yes. Okay. So you can put it on the perimeter if you get that approval but that doesn't say those lights don't have to follow the color temperature yeah. and the, the lumen cap. Yeah, it just seemed to be there, the, it was expressed that there was ambiguity there. Yeah, I think, I think being redundant also leads to misinterpretation. So I think, you know, it's a mm -hmm. half dozen one way and yeah. Okay. I think that's probably another example of something that we might state in different language in outreach materials that would say, this is the only, or, you know, this is how you're allowed to use motion lighting, or this is how you're allowed to use lighting around the perimeter. It still has to follow this, that, and this, but it can be on the perimeter. Mary, did you? I just have a comment. I just want to thank you guys for doing such a great job on this. Um, and I wanted to thank John for pointing out the health benefits behind the dark skies. Um, and Michelle, you mentioned this a few times and I think we've all experienced it. I don't have blackout shades, but there's multiple homes in Brisbane that have such bright lights. It lights up, I mean, in an entire area. And for them to dim those lights or turn them off after eight or whatever the case is, it's just going to make a huge difference. But the health benefits is really important to, I, I think, educate the public on. Um, and I think once they understand that a little bit more, you know, we would probably receive more comp compliance, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to take a time, some time for everyone to comply. 
but getting that ordinance in place is so, it's so important. And so I just want to thank you because I know it was a lot of work. Yeah. One, one thing that we took out of the ordinance that I wish we had been able to keep was light trespass from indoor lighting through giant windows. And, and that, I guess the uh, staff felt that was too hard to enforce. Um, but there are some egregious examples that have come up lately. There were the indoor lighting uh, where the entire side of the house is uh, glass illuminates all the way down to Bayshore. And I think that's an issue, but uh, you know, one step, one major step at a time. Yeah, I, I agree with Michelle, but in the end, we decided not to die on that hill, so. Any last words of wisdom, John? No other than to say, I, I think you all are on the right track here, and um, I'm, I'm excited about this, and also to hear that you're, potentially inspiring some of the other Bay Area communities with your leadership. So that it's kudos to everybody involved. Thanks again for all your help, John. If there's nothing else, I think our goal here was to see a recommendation to the city council. Uh, I would like to see the next chart in the chart deck before I'm willing to go for it. Ah, yes. Thank you. So, Do you want to go ahead and yeah, explain for, what this for anyone long who's listening in of, the public and not a member of Brisbane, we have a long running tradition in town, which is um, lit up stars, uh, usually on the outside of all the buildings. Uh, many houses in town have stars. It's really uh, quite picturesque and quaint to drive by. Um, and in the survey, we received many comments on the Brisbane stars. Uh, some are on the screen right now. And uh, this is a place where I'm gonna tell the rest of OSEC, I believe we might need to make a small change to the draft ordinance that's in the agenda because uh, on an oversight, we made the stars not subject, subject to shielding, but then didn't mention them again. And so how we deal with their curfew light trespass, lumen budget, color temperature are all absent from our ordinance. So uh, with that, uh, the comments in front of us, um, there are people, Adrian, do you want to hit this? You know the survey better than anyone else. Yeah, I will say it was a, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, there are some people who are very adamantly opposed to stars being regulated at all. And there were a couple of other strong comments in support of addressing or regulating stars. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just note this first one, which I think is just a typo that they were referring to lights on Brisbane stars, not, not stairs. Um, Brisbane as a city isn't contradicting itself and showing it does not care for the environment if that is not controlled. Wooden environmentally friendly stars without obtrusive and environmentally harmful lighting are more than sufficient to maintain Brisbane's identity. So you've got comments that, you know, are, are on that side and then comments that are, I am absolutely adamantly opposed to getting rid of the Brisbane stars or any holiday lighting. Um, so you really see both ends of the, the spectrum in the comments here. And um, I would say generally felt like came down more on the side of let us have our stars, but, um, you know, pretty mixed bag. And I, I guess I would say I, I agree uh, with Aaron that the way we currently have it written needs to be changed one way or another, um, because at the very least, um, you know, we've exempted them from shielding, but I don't see that it would be technically possible to not have the bulbs visible. So um, light trespass would also have to be exempted, even if they were subject to color temperature or uh, lumen output or, um, or curfew requirements. So those are, you know, I think the uh, committee could make a recommendation on what level of exemption or inclusion in all of the other requirements you'd like to see 
or like to recommend? Do we also want to meet it all with the liaisons before it goes to council? Well, currently, uh, if you do choose to make a recommendation to council on this tonight, we would potentially be on their agenda on November 16th. I, 16th? Um, so I don't know that there would be time for a liaison meeting before that meeting. Um, we do not have to move this forward uh, to their oh, November okay. 16th agenda. I would like to say that I believe that they get a first read and can ask for changes. And okay. so I feel like putting it in front of them is probably to our benefit because the liaisons still only represent a few members of the council. Here, here. Okay. Yeah, I'm second that. Good. Yeah. I was just asking. Another 12 years. I'm. <laughs> Don't even go there, Jason. Exactly. Uh, so I've had a, a little bit of time to think about this STARS issue because I have been living Dark Skies Ordinance for the last few days, getting ready to push that presentation without tripping over myself. Um, I personally feel like the STARS should not be sub subject to shielding, which they currently are not. Mm -hmm. They should not be subject to light trespass because that would be weird. Um, I do feel that they should be subject to the curfew. And I would like to point out that the curfew in the table makes them automatically not useful for many months in the summer because it's 10 p.m. So I don't care so much about telling people that they can't use their stars in June because it's already captured in the lumen allowance um, curfew. Um, I have an LED star, and so I don't like the idea of CCT being um regulated however my star is addressable so it's manageable um i don't think that everyone else has that ability and so I, it seems like there would be a lot of people that we would be um basically telling they need to telling them they need to remake their star and i don't have thoughts about whether or not stars should be part of the lumen budget i'm interested in everyone else's personal thoughts on stars um, I'm going to just chime in here because I've also been thinking about this. Um, I think it should be exempt from trespass. I think it should be exempt from shielding. I think it should be exempt from color temp because some people want to put up their, um, their Ukraine stars or their pride stars. And, and I think it's very essential that they're exempt from color temp. I think the curfew is maybe a good idea, and I think maybe a lumens cap or saying that they have to be part of the um, the the budget. You know, either one is fine. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm flexible on that issue. I agree with Barbara on that. Um, the, the very same for me. Exempt from trespass. Exempt from shielding. Exempt from. The third one, and then and and curfew is a good idea. The only one I I'm not sure it should be exempt from in the regards is there was something in here I can't remember exactly where it was, where there's the flashing rapid movement thing. It should be exempt. They, they should be exempt. They should not be exempt from that. You know where it's like migraine makers. Seizure inducing, yeah. Seizure inducing light shows at a rapid pace. Do you know what I mean? I do, but I also think the more the more you lash the Brisbane star, the yeah. more pushback you're gonna get. So yeah. I mean it's like flashes till ten PM. We'll all get over it. And should it should it be later than that during certain on New Year's, we leave ours on all night. I don't think they'll arrest you on New Year's. They might, but it won't be for that. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, yeah. I'm, so I'm I just want to make sure I captured what seems to be the prevailing sentiment is that we would not subject stars to shielding, light trespass, or color temperature requirements, but they would be subject to curfew and included in the overall lumen output. Did I get that correct? That's what I heard from I heard, at least four of us. 
everyone was kind of flexible on having them be part of the Zoom in camp. Yeah, I don't, excuse me. I, I think I heard most people were flexible and kind of ambivalent about them being part of the Lumen Cap. Okay. Um, I, I want to clarify. Um, I, either they should have a perfixture Lumen Cap like we did on the low voltage lighting, or they should be included in the um, oh, budget. The budget. overall Lumen output Over, overall allowance. Overall Lumen output for the parcel. I'm not, I'm not real happy with no restrictions. I agree. Agreed. Good, good one, Barbara. Yeah. I think I would recommend in that case going with part of the overall lumen output. Um, seems like that would, if you want to put your whole lumen budget into your star and not have any other lights, that's your winter. <laughs> that's your decision, I think. Um, okay. Thank you. So I believe the next thing is probably for us to vote on it. Um, um, are I there have, any other changes? Yeah, I was going to I have that. one other uh, suggestion, and this was just responding to people in the community. Um, I we we want to. I think we need to stick with light, no light trespass from property to property. But I was wondering if we could add a one liner that says um, something about light trespass onto public roads will not be controlled. Um, just because I think, you know, there's a certain amount of concern about pedestrians at night. And so I think some spill from the houses onto the road is probably acceptable and maybe even useful in terms of um, making people who are walking out at night feel safe. I want to disagree there. Okay. I, uh, there's a, uh, one right on on Humboldt, and it's flashed up at eye level. It goes right into the into the eyes of a driver, right into the eyes of a pedestrian. Mm -hmm. It's horrifying, and there's nothing I could do right now. There's no ordinance I can say, please don't do that. I well, I mean, it would still have to be pointed down. Yeah, I still okay. just think don't trespass. You know, there's you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my reaction was kind of on um, twofold. One is. Making sure we're very clear on what the definition of light trespass is as written in the ordinance is really that you can't see the source of the light. So the, the bulb itself should not be visible from outside of that property. That doesn't mean that light, you know, bouncing off of the ground or other surfaces would not, you know, could not potentially extend beyond the edge of the property. Um, so I, I want to be clear about that. And then... Um, I think kind of second is just remembering that enforcement is going to be complaint based. So if it's something that is not bothering someone and no one is complaining about, it's probably not going to come up for enforcement. Um, and I'm seeing, I know um, I didn't mention, but um, uh, our senior planner helping out um, wasn't able to join us live but um, she <laughs> she did say she'd be available on teams for comment and I'm getting some comments back from her so um, okay uh, so actually she had a different opinion on the um, stars she said please no inclusion of star in overall site budget she'd prefer a per fixture like string lights from a compliance standpoint um, doesn't want the site inventory to have to verify the compliance of a star. Good point. So mm -hmm. I think in, unless there's any opposition to that, that's a very valid point. So we should probably go with that. Yeah. Here, here. And what would that, yeah, that number be? Really, really com complicated because the number of lamps per star is very different depending on what source of lighting you use to light up your star um i don't think i don't think we need to do why does the number of lamps matter some of the stars are three feet wide and some of them are <laughs> well if you have a 16 wide. foot star you're going to have to use lower wattage bulbs or lower lumen bulbs i should say i misspoke there then if you have like a four foot star, then you can put in some more intense bulbs. Because no, also it matters the spacing between the bulbs. Not in terms of the total number of lumens output, does it? Yes. 
because you're imagining it's the same string lights that are going on a big star versus a small star, but there's also the spacing between the fixtures and that's gonna add up lumens as well. Okay. I guess I don't understand scientifically how lumens work quite as well. Because um, I thought it was a, a bulb put out a, a discrete number of lumens. So, yeah. Um, so if I have a four foot star mm -hmm. with lights every inch, mm -hmm. it's the same number of lights and lumens as having a eight foot star with those same oh. number of lights, yeah. right? Yeah. Just so just it's not that you need to change the brightness of the light, it's that you'd need to change the number of lights. Well, or if you the... wanna have a light every six inches versus every foot, then uh -huh. you can change the the intensity of the bulbs, right? So, I, I think we're just miscommunicating. I don't think we're disagreeing. Right, right. I don't think we're disagreeing either. <laughs> okay. I, I just think it's going to be really hard to regulate this because you yeah. can't do it by the bulb output because it also matters how many bulbs you're going to put on your stock. Yeah, no, you just do bulb bulb times number of output and times number of bulbs. Okay. And All as long right. as that's under. 600 lumens or whatever it is we say, then it's fine. If I might suggest, I think we were talking about having a dark sky subcommittee meeting uh, next week yep. to iron out any right. issues that came up Let's here. So I, yeah. I would yeah. suggest yeah. perhaps that's a, a topic for us to address at that subcommittee meeting next week and see if we can come up with a recommendation for a reasonable output limit for stars. So do we need a motion to uh, approve approve, tentatively approve this for a uh, council meeting uh, on November, what date it is? I don't think you need to mention the council meeting date. I think the issue is whether you want to recommend it for consideration by council. I'd like to move that we can move to- Can uh, I second it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can I modify just by saying we're gonna include um, the stars are not subject to trespass, shielding, correlated color temperature. They are subject to curfew and that the dark skies subcommittee will work out the lumen cap, cap here, here. in the next week or so. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Or just, just throwing it out there. If you just leave the lumen cap out and, yes. and, and, and have common sense be that, the guide. That is an easier way of getting it Common sense that if a neighbor can say to another yeah. neighbor, that's killing me. You know what I mean? Yeah, staff isn't going to like that because they're going to want to know what they enforce. Well, leave it Maybe one person talk at a time. Yeah, that's so. Pick a you. How many angels dance on the head of a pin? On oh mic. Who's going to get a little meter for this? You, do you have your mic on? I can see. It's hard yeah. to follow for the anyone watching. What's that? It's hard to follow for anyone watching one person at a time and use the mic. Yes, good, good. I recommend that we, we move it to move it forward. Great. I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You heard me. That's what I like to do. Uh, so I just heard both Mary and Jason say perhaps we don't need the lumen cap and we recommend moving it forward. Uh, Glenn, it looks like you were ready with a comment. Did you not have one? Oh, sorry. Was it? I thought I saw one from Mary. Was it Shauna? It, it's not about this particular thing. Okay. It's, it's about something else. <laughs> 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 Got it. Um, I personally am okay with not having a lumen cap because I feel like the stars are going to be contentious enough. Yeah. Here, here. So I think we need a vote. All right. So I'm going to make a motion that we... No, we made a motion. We already made a motion. You so we're call for the vote. But, wait, but we're not going to include a lumen cap in those edits. Uh, so now we need a vote. Mary. Oh, I'm all for it, yes. Jason. All for it. Barbara. Aye. Michelle. Absolutely aye. Glenn. Yes. And Shauna. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. It is unanimous. Yeah, here. Thank you. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Can we go home now? <laughs> John, I want to thank you very much for your time and your presentation. We will be in touch as we 
wrap this up and and get ready to move it forward. But for now, uh, I think you are welcome to leave if you would like, but and uh, with with our sincerest thanks. Can you send us a copy of your presentation? Yeah, I but have the copy of the presentation, John. Is it acceptable for me to share it in PDF form? Yeah, a absolutely. And note that uh, much of what I said is in the speaker notes. So if you'll include those, that they'll see the notes and they'll get everything. Okay, That'd be great. Because we'll some of those graphics were awesome, and I I want to see those again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. Good night. There was one more thing that we didn't talk about, and I don't know if we still want to or if we want to just punt this to the subcommittee as well. Um, but I, oh, my Zoom kicked me off again and you lost my screen share. Um, was this to discuss any recommendations for education and outreach or financial support? So we already talked about the education and outreach a bit. I think that's something that the subcommittee can talk about more and will probably be a conversation that will continue. Uh, even beyond the ordinance moving forward. Um, one thing that I would love to get at least a, a bit, a brief bit of input on is financial support. There were multiple comments through the survey about potentially having the city provide um, financial support or free low output compliant bulbs for people with financial hardships. Um, and I wonder if that is something that the subcommittee or the, the committee would like to include in your recommendation to council to, con to consider um, if they decide to move forward with the ordinance. Barbara? Oh, I guess, first of all, we should decide if we want to talk it now, talk about it now or do it with the subcommittee. And I personally think we should have our first go around with the ordinance first to find out where we're at with the council. Except they could love it and decide to approve it. And then we would work out the financial help for people who needed it as we usually do. Well, I would just mention that in our staff report that goes along with any item to the city council, there is a fiscal impact. So if the subcommittee or OSEC would like to recommend that we provide financial support that would pertain to the financial impact that I and senior planner will need to write into the staff report. Uh, Glenn? I think it's a good idea for us to do that, but one thing we might check into, I have no idea if this has legs or not, but a while ago, PG&E was giving away um, compact fluorescent light bulbs and we were trying to get people off incandescence. And since this is an energy saving measure, I'm not sure how significant it is with LEDs, but it would save some. Um, we might look into whether they could uh, help with this, but I think we should consider some sort of financial support as a sweetener. I just don't have any idea how much. Jason? I guess I will speak. I just want to, I want to second what Michelle said. And I know that your report ideally should have financial, but considering the solutions can range from just turn it off, which is zero, to a piece of aluminum foil, which is four cents. I just don't think we can sit here and know what, what people want or will need, and just turn it off is an option, which is zero. Glenn? You're right, Jason, but... Um, this is a sort of anti-pushback strategy. Um, I think we are going to get some pretty vigorous pushback, judging by that survey. And so I think we should at least consider some financial support. I know what you're saying. Totally know what you're saying. I just don't think the offer of two compact bulbs is going to get any Krabby Appleton, you know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> think but, about all the free toilets we tried to give away. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The That's, robust response. So let's take, I, I think that we should have the ordinance and then, you know, work on what we, what surfaces as a real need going forward. I mean, that, I think uh, putting that in fiscal impacts that we're going to have to pay for people's retrofits is a little bit probably in the cart before the horse, because we don't know yet 
what that even would be. And so that's a guessing game, just like a uh, million dollars for retrofitting our streetlights. You know, it's a, it, it is, it's, it's kind of like very similar. I mean, if the financial impact is so high to pass the ordinance, it won't pass. So it's, 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 we're kind of on a fulcrum here. So do you have to quantify it in the report? It doesn't necessarily have to be right. super then, specific. Then maybe we should just say, you know, consideration of additional support for a low income or however we want to word it should be included without, and, and, you know, we could quantify it later. Yeah. But we, I mean, it sounds to me like we all, it, it'll be necessary, right? For s certain folks that will want uh, a little support. Yeah. And um, we could, you know, work out the details and bring it yeah, back with yeah. the budget or, right. you know, other items, um, you know, as we move forward with education and outreach and yeah. see what people really want and need. Um, but I think it would be helpful to Glenn's point or Michelle's point, whoever made the point about, you know, this is this is something to help address opposition uh, mm -hmm. a bit ahead of time. I don't think it really will help address opposition. Yeah, um, I, I, I asked the question if we wanted to get into this right now, but it seems like we are. Okay. So I'm going to say um, we had that energy toolkit where we had like coupons for Ace Hardware for people to pick up stuff and had like zero uptake on it. <laughs> like we were giving away money and nobody <laughs> wanted it. We couldn't give away the toilets. Um, you can, okay, some, somebody got a toilet. Um, <laughs> You can still get the energy tool, energy upgrade toolkit from the library. That includes a free light bulb. Um, PG&E has energy upgrade programs for low income people that can, they can get free retrofits for that from PG&E. Um, and I, I kind of feel like overall, I'd like to save our pennies for the municipal upgrades, but so I'm not super enthused about this. So maybe in the staff report, you can mention all the things that Barbara just mentioned, that there are programs out there to help people. Yeah. And if we find that that is not enough, we can look further. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Thank you, Adrian. Let's move on. Any staff updates? I just had a couple. Um, the first was to note some of you, especially anybody using the pool may have heard that the um, water heater for the locker room went out. Fortunately, we already had in the works a um, plan to replace it with a heat pump water heater under the um, PG&E GK12 program with Wildan, that same program that we had used to replace water heaters at several other city facilities. Wasn't quite ready to go yet, but we were able to uh, fast track that and get the water heater replaced with a heat pump water heater in about 11 days at no cost to the city. Wow. Uh, so if awesome. you are at the pool and you see a little, a new little shed um, kind of tucked in next to the office there, that's what's in that shed. Right where I used to hang my towel. Right? <laughs> Sorry. We'll put a new hook. Um, so <laughs> The other items were, um, some folks have asked about this and um, just became aware that um, PG&E does have an induction cooktop loaner program. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a good graphic right now. So this is just something I grabbed off of their website, but I think we're gonna have this out in the um, newsletters and potentially other places. I sent it to um, Caroline. So um, you can get an induction cooktop loaner. PG&E will mail it to you. So you want to try it out, check it out. Um, and then my last two items, I think I will actually maybe just mention under subcommittee uh, updates. Anything? Are we running on the list? Uh, Vin subcommittee. Michelle. Day in the park was hot. Yes. Hot and hot. Yes. And Adrian made a spinner, but that's the only person who did. I think it was just too <laughs> hot for kids to want to sit down and there were too many other things for them to do. But we did have a lot of people 
come by the booth and a lot of uh, participation from the committee across the board. So it was, I think, a good day had by all. And Adrian, I, as a committee member on this, I really appreciated your over-the-top efforts to make it. Uh, and it, it. And it turned out to be a hospitable place for people to stop and sit in the shade for a while. So it was very uh, different than normal, but really nice. It, it was handy that we had that extra empty tent next to us. We got to spread out all of the extra t-shirts from all of the Habitat days over the year. And I'm really appreciating the newfound open space in my office where those boxes used to stack. Uh, I have learned that t-shirt giveaway is the most popular thing at Day in the Park. <laughs> was loved by all. And it was nice because we were right next to Mountain Watch and they also had a very leisurely, you know, sort of like it, it became like a space at the day in the park. Yeah. Go hang out with the greenies. Mm -hmm. All right, moving down. Uh, education outreach. I don't have anything to update. No, we, we, haven't. we haven't met, right? We, we need to met. schedule a meeting. Okay. Well, based on all these ordinances that we're pushing through, you guys are going to have a lot of work. <laughs> and I know that's we all. So, yes. Uh, building decarb has not met. No, but this was my other things that I put on my uh, updates list. So, um, Peninsula Clean Energy and their consultants from TRC have a new points-based approach for reach codes that they shared that we could look over and discuss if we want to um, consider taking up. And um, at our RICAPS meeting yesterday, um, the, the group has been talking a lot lately about municipal facility electrification, and they uh, mentioned that they are working on a template municipal electric first policy. So that's something else that we could potentially consider. Um, so I think it's maybe a good time for us to think about getting a meeting on the books. And yeah, great. You wanna send out a survey or something? Sure, unless you guys wanna try to stick around and compare calendars at the end. Uh, I'm gonna run at the end, so let's do a survey. Okay. Moving down, uh, open space plan. We have not met, but I would like us to. It's been really busy, Karen, but let's get something on the books, even if it's in January. And the frog habitat. Do we have the um, new, sorry, the open space um, the document that was supposed to be updated. That's what we were waiting on. Yeah, that's what we're so, waiting on. Yeah. So we need that before the meeting so we can review it and then bring yeah. comments. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Crocker Trail Frog Habitat. No, we haven't done any meetings. I think now that the trail paving has been done, we can sort of look at again, you know, maybe putting some of those edge, those nice branch edgings back or because they all had to be moved. All that nice, that sort of aesthetic Yeah, I don't know if Paul, Paul, Paul Buscal is the one who assembled all of that initially, yeah. and I don't know if he I is. haven't walked by there in the last week or so, but at one point I noticed that they had put them in the pond area yeah. itself. Um, and I, like I said, I haven't walked over there, and I probably will do that this weekend, but um, just to... <laughs> see what's going on <laughs> but um if i if i find that there's just a lot of large wood in there should i do a, a, a fix it request karen i don't think what's going on with my mic um I think that Paul moved them out of the way for the construction and as he started to put them back oh, okay. i didn't know where he'd put them but I think he's actively working on that. I don't, I thought, Jason, had you gone out and worked with him once? I didn't work on it. No, I just looked at it. Okay. <laughs> and I hadn't um, tried to ask for that meeting with the property owners yet because I was getting the council liaison meeting we had that we're about to talk about for invasive species and one for complete streets. So 
it's asking for a lot of meetings all at once, but we'll work on getting that set up. Okay, um, moving on down, invasive species ordinance. I've talked enough. Glenn, Jason, you guys want to give an update? Yeah, we met yesterday actually with council liaisons and with a number of city staff and um, it was a really good meeting. I was glad that we met with council liaisons. I thought it was really useful. We got a lot of good feedback and so the ordinance is still under construction. Uh, a lot of things were, were brought up and batted around. This is going to be not so easy it's kind of like dark skies in that there are a lot of details that need to be considered but the feedback we got was very helpful so um i guess we need to meet again one of the things we need to meet about is to figure out public education materials that was something that came out of our meeting so that's the subcommittee that needs to meet on that divvy up the research job and then wait to hear back for specific feedback from uh, city staff, I believe. Is that anybody want to add anything? Jason? No, no, I thought it was a great meeting. Um, I think we were set to go, right? If we got the stuff from staff, I'm very positive. <coughs> and, and, yeah. and I thought super intelligent um, feedback from our liaisons. I thought they were really dialed into what we were, were doing. And, and I think on our side and saying, let's, let's do this. So yeah. very, very nice. I felt like most of the, imp the input that we got was related to compliance and of enforcement, enforcement yeah. right. which, right. which doesn't actually feel like a lot of work um, right. by the volunteers on OSEC. Unfortunately, Karen, it's, it's for you to coordinate on the other side. But I do feel like a meeting would be useful just so that we could talk about bamboo and um, and some other things that I wrote down during the meeting, mostly just to get it on paper before the holiday. So maybe maybe a meeting in the next couple weeks. Just, just one other comment on that. Meeting with the council liaisons was so helpful that I think OSEC should really make that kind of a standard step when a, an ordinance recommendation is put forward. It was, it was really useful. But not dark skies. Well, we did. We, we met wait. with them. We did meet we with them. We did? Okay. Yeah. That's when we uh, yeah. switched from Malibu back to, you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving on down. Uh, dark skies, uh, you guys are all aware. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, Mary, I just ahead. wanted sorry. to, I wasn't at the last meeting, but the meeting before, I kind of volunteered to get some information on the goats. Yeah. And, and gorse, which kind of falls in the invasive species. Yes, thank you. So I did call, uh, just FYI, I think I CC'd a couple of you on, um, yeah, you guys got it. Okay. Um, I call, and I'm trying to remember, it was called City Grazing. It's a nonprofit outfit in the city that ha they have goats that come out and will eat um, anything. <laughs> um, they asked me, oh, I said, oh, we have really dense gorse. We need to get rid of it quick. Oh, she goes, no way. She goes, we will not let our goats. That's too much for them. They will come out if it's, if, you know, just new growth and they'll clean it up that way. And the cost for that ranges anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000 per acre. It's on the higher side if they have to provide fencing, $2,000 if not. Um, so that was, she goes, no, you need, it sounds like you need like forestry equipment, mastication <laughs> to come in and just pull the stuff out. And that's really expensive. I didn't do any research on that. I can do that. Um, and then um, Kim Folian, I guess, reached out to you, Adrian, a resident of Brisbane, and was asking about that as well. And she offered up uh, a contact. She works at Genentech and she knew one of the landscapers. So we've been uh, trading phone calls back and forth. But I, she said, she goes, Mary, he's probably going to tell you the same thing. Yeah. So anyway, so it's good for just, you know, low growth, okay. cleanup maintenance, but not to get rid of, uh, you know, densely packed gorse. So I wanted to report back and let you know that I did that. So thank you. Thanks, Mary, for mm -hmm. looking into that. Um, uh, Glenn? Just one other invasive species thing. Um, I live next door to council member Mackin and she texted me last night saying that she had seen 
on the news a marvelous machine that is being employed in the East Bay that apparently will rip out small eucalyptus trees by the root. Hmm. And I had such a busy day today, I haven't had a chance to watch the thing, but uh, we might want to consider that because we've got a lot of eucalyptus coming up um, and, and we also might want to recommend it to the county to deal with the infestation in the park. So I'll look into that and report back. But these are young eucalyptus. Yes. How old? I don't know. I, I have not watched the thing yet. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, dark skies, I think we're all on board. Tree issues. for the for the first report we haven't had a meeting um because two out of three of us were on the dark skies <laughs> <laughs> but we need to have one and soon because there's a lot of trees that have been taken out lately and we we really need to uh move forward on that and adrian do you have anything more on the um yeah, I was just curious. I I did forward you that um, uh, that code about um, the best way to prune some some pruning recommendations. Was that included in any of the other? It's going to be in the star. Oh, yay! Yay! yay. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't realize no, I, I hadn't responded to you I about that. I hadn't yes. heard from anybody. I was like, oh, I just sort of punted that into the <laughs> into the void. I'm sorry. My inbox has been a bit of a mess lately. <laughs> Um, I apologize for that. It's in the star. Oh, cool. uh, you'll see it on November 1st. Um, I worked with Caroline and we, uh, I think pretty much verbatim used it. We might have done a little bit of formatting tricks on a few things to turn it into bullets or whatever and, and tried to tighten it up a bit to, to fit space-wise. But yeah, it's, it's in there. Cool, cool. Yeah. I, I know that the cleanup weekend is coming. Um, November 4th and 5th. Yeah, but I'd just like to make sure we remind people in the blast that you still need a tree permit if you are going planning to remove a tree and don't chop off yes that includes severe trimming yeah so don't don't use this as an opportunity to you know clear cut your yard but he already always does yeah but if we could get that in the blast and it's a not reiteration trash. of that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's, I think the article that's in the star was just basically what Shauna put together with like a line about, you know, upcoming yeah. um, tree uh, or uh, winter cleanup. Um, but I think in the, on the website, it does have information about and like links to the page about the, removal requirements um all we should make sure it's in yeah. the blast with the announcement of the cleanup and getting also, there will they be coming around and picking up at if you call them to come up and pick at pick up at your in front of your house like they have in the past there is assistance available that information is also on the website i have not been involved in this in the past and now am for the first time due to some retirements so i don't know if it's exactly the same as the past i think it is okay good but yeah can't say for sure thanks for taking that over for the city adrian uh so the next three items are the bayland specific plan chapter groupings and i'm going to guess there's nothing nothing uh i'm some... in the binder oh good <laughs> <laughs> uh so next calendar items <laughs> I have things to say on this. Uh, we, I was in touch with Jeff and Ariel about a winter planting day date, and we are proposing February 3rd, which is the first Saturday of February. It's basically the same weekend we did last year. Um, works for all of us. So unless there are any major concerns, I think we'll probably go with that. Um, and then uh, while we were in touch about that, we also started pondering what we would do for Earth Day, which is April 22nd. The Saturdays around that are April 20th or 27th. And it doesn't seem at this point that any of the three of us have a strong preference. So I'm curious if anyone here has a preference either. Yeah, I think we go with April 20th because that is closest to Earth Day. 
There's always something that gets screws me up. So I'm going to go back to my last year's April calendar. Just give mm -hmm. me a sec here. Well, while she is looking for that, I will note that um, I believe we'll uh, likely have our agenda next meeting um, have Teresa from Scavenger here to do her annual diversion report. Do we only do the invasive species litters that just once a year? Because I found a new... To nurseries? Yeah. In fact, I don't even think we've been doing it every year. I think it's actually in every other year. Okay. But I think, I think we are due. I think we're due yeah. this year. Annie's Annuals is selling scabiosas. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's favorite place. <laughs> and they are selling all sorts of colors of scabiosas. Yeah. They, for a long time, they only sold Fama Blue. And I was personal friends with Annie Hayes. So I was able to kind of put this kibosh on a lot of the other scabiosas. But she has since sold the business. Yeah. So. They're fair game. Might be nice to wait until we have an invasive species ordinance because we could include that notification in the letter that we've made it illegal to plant certain things in Brisbane. And so that might make the letter a bit more punchy. <clears throat> uh, very good I, point. I would agree with you that, you know, it's a kind of a toothless thing, you know, as much yeah. as we might feel good about sending this little note, I'm sure they, they take a look at it. But if, if we just say these things are going to be illegal in in Brisbane, that that might have some more heft to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we currently have it uh, on the calendar to do those in April. So if we uh, have, you know, depending on what the status is, we can decide if we want to modify the letter or move up or move back or. That, that sounds actually like it's pretty good based on the schedule that we talked about because it was Q1, two. So I would almost yeah. do it earlier. I would do it March because na nurseries put in their order for, you know, and, and their grow orders ahead of time. And uh -huh. if, if there's wholesalers like Annie's, we should address that a lot sooner, like, you know, January. Yes, or even if it was like Brisbane is enacting or, you know, like that, it's pretty imminent to, to yeah. Put it that way to, mm -hmm. to, to Glenn's point that this is coming. So if you want to buy this stuff, it's going to be illegal for the, the customers that live in Brisbane. Yeah. And nurseries that are near to us, we could even send them a little thing to post on their bulletin board of don't buy these if you live in Brisbane. Yeah. Glenn? May I ask a little bit of a tangential question? So I've been talking with Adrian about this. Has the county said anything about tackling the pampas grass in the park? They were supposed to, I mean, Can we come? We, you, you were under the impression that they were coming and they were going to deal with it. They, it's spreading. It's spreading a lot. They, um, I don't know when exactly they are coming to address that, but I know at the last, I think it was the weed management area meeting, but it could have been the San Bruno Mountain Natural Resources Coordinating Meeting because I sometimes get them confused. They both only happen like quarterly and I only started attending them after Bob's position changed. Uh, one of them at the last meeting, there was a great presentation on the pampas grass efforts on Montara Mountain mm -hmm. uh, that have been happening in the last year. And they did mention some other places that they wanted to go next. So um, I can try to look back at those notes and see, or otherwise the natural resources meeting, I'm pretty sure is next week. So, um, you know, probably we'll have more of an answer after that. If we could just keep prodding them, I think that would be good. I think I asked them about pompous grass or gorse <laughs> every other meeting. <laughs> and I don't go to very many or have a whole lot to say for the most part. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you. Uh, anything else on the calendar? Chair and committee members. Did we, did we hear a, did I hear a, 
or April about 20. a preference or yeah, no I um I don't think I can answer it right now so I prefer okay. April 20th at this point unless someone has a big conflict because it's closer closer to Earth Day fine by me hmm? sounds good to me okay oh there's our pictures that's it yay yeah. Next meeting. Next. Oh, next meeting. This is something. Actually, no, I can't answer you. I found the thing I was looking for. April 20th works. The following week and the 27th does not work for me. All right, so April 20th is the answer. Fantastic. Uh, I've got one more. I'm sorry to keep you guys. Uh, at the last meeting that I wasn't at, you guys said, let's do the next meeting on December, I believe it was 13. Yes. I cannot make that meeting. Uh, is there any chance the week before that works for the rest of you? Not on Wednesday. Oh. Did the week before that on Thursday, mm -hmm. December 7th. So the week before that on Wednesday, December 6th, is the complete streets meeting. So we cannot meet that night. But uh, the council meeting <laughs> the, the council meeting on the 7th has been moved to the 14th. So we have availability and MCTV support available for Thursday the 7th, if that will work. Does that does that work with everyone else? I'm sorry to change your schedules around. Yeah, I, it's I, fine I, for me. I can't do it. Okay. I have to have a, a, a performance that night. I mean, it's okay. You can go down. That's fine. Honestly. And I'm not certain about that date at this juncture. I would. What, what's, the, what's the one we were at? On? December 13. 13. I can do. And 7, I can't do. But it, that's really okay. I won't get a complex. Let's wait in here on Shauna and then can we decide after this meeting? I, I would like to make a decision tonight because the planning commission is meeting tomorrow and also needs to discuss their meeting <laughs> schedule during the holidays. So it would be great if we can settle this. Um, yeah, that it involves moving a Thanksgiving from Thanksgiving to that, <laughs> that time frame to deal with some people that are no, I can't, no. but it, I'm okay with it. I will figure out how to call in on the 13th. But I'm okay. So the 13th works for everyone, but Aaron, the 7th doesn't work for at least two. Right. Yeah. It's all good. Make it work on the 13th. I will make it work on the 13th. I will be remote. Okay. So yeah, seven. planning commission does generally meet on Thursday, so that's probably better. We stick with our usual day of the week, allow them to potentially stick with their usual day. You know, if the government shuts down on the 20th, I might not travel anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> I might not either, dang it. And then there's all kinds of options that come I'm back sorry. on the table. <laughs> all right, uh, is that it? Meeting's adjourned? <laughs> so what are we, the 7th? Uh, yes, no. we are back to whatever. 13. December 13th. 13th. I will update the calendar invites. Yeah for those who actually use those. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dark Skies Committee. You guys are awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, uh, the thanks for your patience with this long meeting as well. Everyone. Well, There's a lot of that ordinance. Two and a half hours. I don't know how you guys thought about it so as long as you did. At least it was in 12 years. <laughs> it's hard. So I only have like one and a half. Rest, huh? And I got the exam. Yeah, well, we're basically where we ended.